Hello, Dean. How are you? Hi, Lilu. It's good to meet you in person. Oh, yeah, thanks. Nice to meet you, too. I was very moved by your story in The Secret Journey of the Heart. And thank you for allowing us to stay on the Juicy Living Tour here in this beautiful property. Oh, yeah. It's our honor, for sure. Uh, and tell us tell us about your story, because your, your story is truly an inspiration. Well, I guess to sum it up, in a nutshell, you know, I have no memories of my life before I'm 12 years old. And once I was 12 years old, I remember uh, not feeling good. There was something that didn't feel right about being here. I never fit in. I never quite felt comfortable in being here. And what was interesting, you know, I came from a, a good background. I had a lot of people that cared about me. So I wound up taking a lot of chemicals and that really began my journey of exploration into the kind of the the dark and you know the shamanic path has a lot of darkness you know light and dark um, mm -hmm. not just the light path but and what I was I began the process of going to a multitude of treatment centers and picking up a multitude of different kinds of addictions and every time I would go to a treatment center you know I was relieved to go there because I thought wow perhaps this time I can get it maybe this time I can find out what is causing me to have such conflict within myself that I keep hurting myself and I would listen to instructions because these people for the most part they're a reasonable bunch of people and time after time after time I would get out and follow instructions and pretty soon I would be right back um, taking mm. more drugs, more chemicals, you know, and basically the the reason why people continue to do that is because they're in pain, and a lot of time that might be sub subconscious. We don't even realize that we are, but for someone that would make a decision, and humans always make the best decision that they can, and so when somebody makes a decision to do that, that means you know, in their mind, their options are limited and they're mm -hmm. not feeling so good about themselves. So after being in treatment again and again, and I tried everything, I, I, I had a medical, an underground medical treatments where I had things implanted in my body. Um, it's illegal, but I had a doctor do it and um, to try to block the opiates from my receptor site. I had rapid opiate detox. I've been inpatient, outpatient, downpatient. I've been in so many different kinds of treatment protocols mm -hmm. um, with so many different kinds of people, and I noticed that they weren't getting it either. And one thing that that spirit gave me the the wisdom to pay attention. So when I got there, I was paying attention, and because I wanted the, the answer, you know, I wanted to know why and not to not do it anymore and go live my life. Yeah. And one day. Um, Again, and during this process, I mean, I overdosed so many times, weird injuries, um, two near-death experiences. And you were getting harder and harder on yourself yeah, through that process. I mean, it was a horrendous process. And, and you know, in the near-death experience that I had, we hear so many people that say, oh, I, I saw the angels of light, they came to get me. Not for me. I went to the place that is known as Bardo Plain Purgatory, um, the, dark the, night of the soul. Dark, it was the scariest thing that has ever happened. Wow. And interestingly enough, I felt so bad. I had given up so much hope that I, um, I woke up in the hospital after that. And pretty soon I was just doing the drugs right in the hospital. I had some with me, you know, oh. hooked up to all equipment. And so I, I had death right behind me. And um, so I went to treatment again. And there I began to have a vision. And it was interesting because I thought, wow, there's what's going on here? You know, I can't keep doing this. I really thought I knew my life was coming to its end. And the scariest part of that was I thought that that God or Great Spirit was going to give my life purpose to somebody else, mm. that I was my assignment was going to be given to somebody else. And I thought that was even worse than not being alive. I was like, I, I didn't I didn't finish what I came here for, even though I didn't even know what it was. And so I began to think of a movie that I saw years ago that made an impression on me. And that movie was The Horse Whisperer. Oh, yeah. And The Horse Whisperer is very energetic, very shamanic. And all of a sudden I thought, that's what this place is supposed to look like for healing. There's no healing going on in any of these places. Nobody's shifting. And so I woke up one day and I decided I was leaving that place. I came to Sedona. Why Sedona? Because I just knew that it had to be here. I got here. You had this knowing then. I had a knowing because I, I was 
I was, I came to Sedona one day and I finally got the hit that this was my home. Uh -huh. And in my younger life as a searcher, I've been searching, I've traveled all over the world looking and I've lived in an, a monastery and an ashram and all these things looking for this thing that was right here the whole time. Right. So I, um, I looked around and I said, you know, this is your home. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, this is why I went through all those things because that was my training. Mm -hmm. My, you know, in the shamanic path that I have studied for the last 10 years or so, um, the way people become shaman, they get hit by lightning. And so if you happen to live, then you're the shaman. They know that's the power. And if you don't happen to live, then maybe next life, who knows what happens. <laughs> but that was my initiation, all of that sort of seeing the darkness and the dark night of the soul for me lasted years. How long? I had probably a dark night of the soul that lasted maybe five years. And, um, and what was interesting was... So you, ha you must have had suicida suicidal yeah, thoughts. Yeah, I was at the end of my rope. What was probably the most profound thing is that nobody knew. I kept it all inside. Oh, my goodness. I, I kept it all inside. And, you know, what was interesting, one day um, I was sharing with my father, who I've been very close to, um, I, I was taking an exorbitant amount of drugs and... Um, I snuck off to go to detox and I got about two months into this, you know, a clean period, which I've had many of those. Um, and so I finally decided I was going to share this with someone, you know, and I was sitting there having dinner with my father and I said, by the way, you know, I, I developed this really bad pill habit and I started taking a hundred Percocet a day and all these different things and, mm. and, uh, and I'm, I'm better. And at first he was, this big smile came on his face because he said, Oh my God, we thought you were going to die of AIDS or some terrible disease. At least this you can deal with. Wow. And then he got this bewildered look on his face and he said, why would anyone want to ever go through that all by themselves? Oh my you know, goodness. Why would anyone, it seems like the hardest thing that anyone would ever have to uh, work with, you know? And I remember that. That must have opened your heart right there. It was very heart opening, but I didn't have the technology. I didn't at that time realize that everything I was looking for was here. Yeah. So my soul has always wanted to connect with people. And I was in a job where I couldn't really be honest in terms of getting to know people. It was very surface. As long as I provided what you asked for and you paid your bill, that's all people cared about. Uh -huh. And, you know, it was very... Unfulfilling. It, it was very interesting because um, one time when I was I, I was in treatment for a couple of months and I came back to my desk and uh, at work and I was going through some ma mail and somebody I haven't seen for 20 years uh, had this had this event that I missed. So I called up and I said, hey, I'm sorry I missed your event. I haven't seen you in 20 years. So we had breakfast together and this person was very successful and just like a storybook life. And so we were talking and I said, you know, well, let me tell you what's happened to me in the last little while. And I said, you know, I developed this really uh, horrendous habit and I've been in this and that. And this person's jaw just dropped on the table. Uh -uh. But it was because I don't think anybody had ever really been honest. And I said, you know, you go to all these parties and all these things. How many people know you? And she, she looked in this bewildered way. She said, nobody. Not one. And that affected her in a very pronounced yeah. way and yeah. and she was it was so refreshing here it is like the most successful person in the city you know on the cover of all these magazines yeah. having lunch with me who's had a different path and in that moment she was like she was so thirsty for that authentic part and that's the part i i knew that i was missing that mm. so i left and i came and i my journey to sedona was about creating a healing center where people could have the shift and people wouldn't have to stay as addicts. You know, the story of being an addict, when I first went there, I said, that must be it. I figured it out. I'm defective. There's a problem and, and this is the solution. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was I wasn't listening to my heart. I wasn't listening to my soul song and our souls want to just speak and be alive. People want to know what their purpose on life is. Well, that's in your soul, not your head. But you had to start to trust yourself, which must be difficult coming from those addictions. Well, we have a, 
we're in a society whereby we people say, oh, think outside the box and be outside the box, but they really don't want you to be outside of the box. We fit into certain mm -hmm. norms. We're not taught to be in our heart. We're taught to work, pay our taxes, pretty much not ask a lot of questions, and just chug along in our lives. And, you know, God love the people that can do that and function in that way. But it's interesting because in this amazing time, less and less people are able to do that. People know something's going on. They know that they're needing to connect here. And my whole purpose in this place was to let people know, you can change your cellular biology. Mm -hmm. You can change your cells because I have done it. And so when we know that we can change our internal technology, that our receptor sites on our brain look like this with a chemical and they become like a lock and a key. Well, we're not stuck with this lock. We can change the lock and then all of a sudden the, it doesn't recognize it in the same way. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we're not addicts anymore mm -hmm. or we're not sick anymore. And we hear, what's interesting, Lilu, we hear these stories of people that have amazing miracles happen to them. People that have cancer and all these problems and and we hear that they can get better, like miracles. Sometimes people have these miracles, but that's them, that's not us. And I'm here to tell you that that is you. Mm. And that's the whole basis for everything that we do. So I knew I had to leave my life and become a teacher. Yeah. That was my heart's calling, to be a teacher healer, to show people that they could step outside of that. And it's interesting that, um, I like to the the people, you know, addicts in particular, can bend time and space. And to explain that to people, when you get so focused, anybody who's watching this or hears that has any kind of substance abuse or people, know people that have that, you know, if you're a drug dealer or a pharmacy, let's say it's an hour away, and they're closing in a half an hour, <laughs> you will make it there in 29 minutes, yeah. period. Yeah. You will be able to do it. So those people are already the shaman. Mm. The, the addiction people are the searchers. Wow. But they're just looking in the wrong place. Uh-huh, yeah. You know, they're looking yeah. in the wrong place, and no one's telling them the place you're looking is right here. Yeah. And, and that just takes a little bit of getting to know ourselves. But those are the people, they are so strong and... Yeah. Um, people say, well, they're weak, and that's a, that's a, because that problem requires conscious participation, right? You can get cancer or sick, and it doesn't require, it just happens. So then those people are victims, right? But not with the substance abuse people and, or other habits, you know, computer and shopping and all these things. That requires participation. Yeah. So all of a sudden we think less of those people because they're participating in their own demise. And their own demise is actually their own soul telling them, will you wake up? Yeah. And that's the call. And the soul will keep recreating the same events over and over and over until we wake up and answer and say, okay, I hear you. And so the, the substance abuse people, they are so far from weak. I, I shared with someone one time. I said, you the know, most intelligent even. I feel like there is a lot of... Sensitive. Yeah. Gifted. Yeah. Type A. Um, we call them vibrationally challenged because they got here. This is such a beautiful world. A lot of them have no reason to be, um, you know, feeling badly, but they do because something about here doesn't feel right. So that's vibrationally challenged. You get here and it doesn't feel right. Then, so you often hear people say, I don't fit in. It doesn't, you know, all yeah. those things. But the people, if we could employ their energy in the right way. Yeah. Because those people are needed right now on the they planet. They are needed right now. And I can tell you something about those people. Yeah. They have strength and power like the person that never had that has understands. And so I ask people that don't understand. I say, you know, imagine the sickest you have ever been in your life. Like just the worst virus or cold. The sickest like you would never even think of getting out of bed. Now imagine you do have to get out of bed. And now imagine you have to do that every day for a decade. That's oh. power. Granted, it's a little misguided power, but nonetheless, it's power. And those people actually have amazing gifts, just like all of us now. So what's happening on, on Earth from that point of view is all the things that used to give us comfort, 
our government, our financial system, our religious organizations, they're all beginning to fall away. And then people are now forced to look at themselves. And if you're not used to that, then there'll be all kinds of ways to distract yourself. Yeah. You know, television is a great way, all those things. But what's great is that during this, it's kind of like I see it kind of, it was an initiation for you, it sounds like, to prepare you for now the kind of really helpful work that is needed on the planet. And you have probably developed even your spirituality with those drugs. I've heard and interviewed some people that said that, you know, some of those drugs actually help in some conditions and depending how they're taken to reach a certain point. But your message is that life is even juicier than that. There is something else beyond that. What you've been searching through the drugs is not it. It's not an end. It's just a beginning. It's, I think that your point there, a lot of times we take drugs and that's the initial Thing. we're seeking that euphoria um, bliss yeah and then before too long that becomes an empty avenue and then it becomes a road of real uh, hardship but I think that um, I have been in many sacred ceremonies so if people could use things like plant medicine has been around since the beginning of time you go and you do it in a sacred way it's a whole different energy yeah and it's a whole different way of being and actually a lot of the the things that we we do is to help people back to connect to that sacredness because the soul yeah. understands the sacredness the soul does not understand English the soul does not understand tax returns and bills due and your phone bill is due and all that the soul connects to the sacred ways and that creative element and and that's where the real gifts are so people search for that in substance is yeah. and then they're using that to just get out of here because it's so uh, difficult to be in society when we're not connected to our soul your soul is calling for you and when we don't answer your soul says well I think I know how to get her attention will create some suffering yeah. and suffering um, is a good motivator for us sometimes yeah. <laughs> so in this place and time to let people know that they have the power, all the great mystics and prophets, Jesus said, everything I can do, you can do. The kingdom of heaven is within you. All of these things, and we think, oh yeah, the in one ear, out the other, we don't take that in. What was he talking about? Well, he was talking about, get your energy together. So, for me, the, the, that included the body, mind, soul, spirit. Those are four elements of a human being. And in my studying here, in my shamanic path, and creating this place how do we help people to shift well we have to work on the whole human being yeah. in a real way not just in words and words people I think are getting sick of words now yeah in a practical in a shade hands-on way it must be scary for people to come here in the middle of nature you know I know you're outside of Sedona it's very silent here how is that is how is the transition from this very loud world to come to this place and you know, Lilu, everybody has to face themselves eventually. And unfortunately, so many people wait until right before they're going to take their last breath. And so, but eventually, it's going to be you and your creator, whatever that means to you. Hey, why not do it now? And so when people come and we get rid of the distractions, so people will come and visit us and they think they're coming here for a certain reason. Well, I'm taking uh, antidepressants or I'm stressed or I'm this or I'm that I'm taking too many drugs and and we'll talk about that for a little while then after like a, a certain period of time then we start talking about what really brought them here lack of connection lack of meaning lack of purpose not connected to all these things that we are so thirsty for that's what really is the root everything else is a symptom so I shared in my talk at the Gift and the Shift, you know, global pharmaceutical sales are a trillion dollar a year business. That's a trillion with a T. <sighs> There's a lot of money in sickness and perpetuating that story of being sick. And, and a lot of times if we can just reconnect to nature, reconnect to our inner nature, it's amazing what then we can learn about ourselves. And all of a sudden when we then connect to that, Lilu, all of a sudden, what we used to think was our making us sick begins to fall away. We don't think about it anymore. It's like when people connect to something that they love to do 
and people that are watching, even if they can't relate to that, even if when you've read a good book and you just you think you're going to just read it for 15 minutes, but you can't put it down, you're so in the moment, you're not thinking of these other things, you're so present for yourself. Well, when you connect that way to what your gifts are, all of a sudden, your sickness is, it, do, it doesn't, it can't exist that way. It can't coexist. It can't coexist. So to be in that, in that stillness is very powerful. Yeah. And that's what eventually people need to know themselves because we're so busy. You know, I have heard one day uh, that the most spiritual thing that anyone can ever do is to do one thing at a time one thing at a time. So if you were going on a job interview right now and they said, hey, Lilu, what's your specialty? And you said, well, you know, I do one thing at a time. They would laugh at you because now we have to multitask. We have to do 20 things at one time. Yeah. We have to do this and that. <laughs> and it drives us crazy. And so it's... Uh, and we disconnect when we do that. We disconnect because stress, then we disconnect. Then we get the stories about all the things we can't do and our shadows and all these things that we must face if we want to truly be happy. And what's interesting, when we're about to face our, ourselves, we think it's, it seems so enormous. Where it's like we're going to jump across the Grand Canyon or something. I can't do it. It's too yeah. so scary. And then once we do it and go through this process, we look back and we say, oh my God, it was only like a crack in the sidewalk. What mm. took me so long? I can't. The I mind was it. there. You know, the mind, the <laughs> ego, the ego just yeah. wants to be alive. So that's how I got here in sort of a nutshell. And I'm mm, not sure if I answered your story. original question it or not. It did and more and it's beautiful. So what does the soul want? The soul, your sheer purpose of your soul is to express its uniqueness. So the soul is that individuated expression of God, of the divine. You know, it's our soul that knows our connection to all things. It's our soul that knows the stories of great civilizations in the past, you know, and great civilizations in the future. Um, our soul knows no bounds and limitations. And our soul doesn't speak English. Our soul speaks in the language of art and music and poetry and nature. And so our soul wants to express itself. That's it, to be whole express itself and offer its gifts to the world. Mm -hmm. That's our job. And so when we can connect to the soul, then all of a sudden things begin to come into our awareness because the soul has your gifts, it has your soul song. And your soul song is that unique song that only you have. So on this planet right now, there are 7,000 souls living, or I'm sorry, 7 billion souls living. Yeah. All of those souls, there are no two that are the same. Yeah. No two. Can, are here for the same exact thing. So that means there's something, Lilu, on this planet like you. You're doing something that no one else can do. And when people wake up to that, all of a sudden, they are alive. And life and the pursuit of life is so much more refreshing and energizing than managing sickness. So it's the soul and all that creative aspect. And when we are in that creative mode, all of a sudden, time stands still. And when, we're, when time stands still, that's when we recognize God and our connection to all of that. So I can't tell you specifically what each soul wants, but if we stop and listen and pay attention, your soul will tell you exactly what you want. And then all of a sudden, the people come in to start to help you. Just like you came here, how did you get here? You could have <laughs> never orchestrated these things. They're here because your soul knows, oh, gosh, I have to go to Sedona and meet some people, crazy people that you'll meet in Sedona and, um, and Wonderful listen. hearted people. Yeah. You're such a beautiful person with a big heart, a man of the heart. Yeah, so, and this is the way that it happens, you know. Mm, it's very inspiring and it takes courage. There's a big courage point. Well, the, here's what the Especially soul... in what you were saying before, and to any souls, for any souls to step in in our own journey is the biggest jump. It is so interesting. You know, intimacy and connection can be so scary for people. People can work and take big risks and um, do a lot of things that appear to be um, 
risky in business or in their personal life, drive race cars or drive crazy or all these things. But you know, being vulnerable is actually the most courageous position that we can pick. And being vulnerable means that we connect to the unknown, that we don't know. Hey, I'm going to say something. I'm going to share something about myself, and I don't know how you're going to react. Maybe you'll think less of me or something. And that vulnerability is the hardest thing for us because nobody taught us how to do that. And you know, in, if we don't answer, and we, some people sometimes get these lightning bolts, oh my God, I'm going to change my life in this way. Mm -hmm. Many people get little signs along the way that they have to, like trail of breadcrumbs, that they have to pick up these crumbs and follow them like clues. Because if you are reading a great book, would you want to know what happens in the next chapter? No, you're in this chapter. I love it. You would never want to know. So that's why we don't know what the end is. And if you could, would you want to? Would you want to know? No, it's it will like, take it away. It takes it away. So it's like going to the movie. You don't want to know how it ends. You want to go in the twists and turns of life. And for some reason, we all go to the movies and we see the underdog and he's having trouble. And all of a sudden, we're rooting for him. It's like, go, oh, you can do it, you can do it. And then in our own lives, all of a sudden we have trouble and we're like, no, I can't do it. Oh my God, you know, our lives are the same. If you think that your life is epic and strong and important, then it is. And if you think that your life doesn't mean anything, then it doesn't. Same life. You decide. You decide what it means. And once we do, once we begin then to listen to our soul, all of a sudden the soul says, wow, he's paying attention to me. I'm going to give him some things, some gifts. You know, I'm going to give him some gifts, some talent, some things that he's been looking for, and that'll keep him going. You know, and then we get to the next little crumb, and that, that's how then we form our journeys. And that's what the great journeys are mm. really about. And I think on planet Earth today, it's about the great journeys. We're all on a great journey. We just have to decide to step in and take it. And when we dive in and let go, it's amazing. Because nobody knows what's going to happen anyway. So if we think we're in control of anything, that's just silly anyway. Yeah. So when we fully abandon and say, you know what, I'm going to go for it. And a lot of um, the work that, that I do also is assisting people in, in the process of, you know, of transitioning. Mm -hmm. and, and of recreating. And re yeah. And, and, and then at the end of their lives, too. And it's interesting how people at the end of their lives, it's very interesting how people don't, you never hear people say, you know what, I shouldn't have ever done that, and I shouldn't have done that, and I shouldn't have asked that girl out for a date 50 years ago, and I should have never taken that job at that crazy place. You always hear people say, you know what, I really should have asked that girl out. And you know, I should have taken that job in some wacky place. And you know what, I should have done all these things. That's what you hear. Mm -hmm. So don't wait. Mm. So, because, again, you're not going to hear people say that they shouldn't have done anything that they did you know for me doing all that having the path that was a, a difficult path that was the best thing i ever mm. did because i wouldn't be standing here with you and have met kelly and have met kelly and you know she's on a journey too what's interesting about her and and she's never connected to any substances ever but she's had the dark night of the soul she's woken up day after day with everything that a person could ever want She's creative in her job. She's this. She's got all the milestones and the trappings of success, yet no connection to her soul. And she wakes up in terror and says, what is the meaning of all of this? And, and her soul then, the, the way that she coped with that is just by being dead, deadened. She's walking around like a zombie. And then to see her finally wake up it's amazing. So we deal with a lot of that people too, because it doesn't matter whether you go out shopping and spend a lot of money or whether you watch TV all day or on computers and all these different things, or you're taking drugs, you're not present. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that matters. One of them is less socially acceptable than the others, but hey, it's all the same. You're not present in your life. And the soul, that hurts the soul. The soul knows whether you're present or not. 
The soul wants you to take risks and go for it. Mm. And when you see somebody that you want and you know, if you're single and, and you see a girl in the coffee shop and you walk up to her, the soul doesn't care that she says, hey, no way, man. The soul just wants you to ask, just wants you to say, you know, gosh, you know, I, I did it. I asked that person on a date. And you'll be surprised at how many times that person's going to say yes. But if we never ask the question, the answer is always no. And that's what really, for me and, and the work that we do here, it's not about stopping your behavior. That never stopped anybody. The, the downside, the adverse conditions that people create in their life, the pain and suffering never stopped anybody from doing anything. Most of the people that I've known on my path and in treatment, they're dead. Most of them are not living right now. So that never stopped them. So the carrot and the stick, the stick is not too effective. And fear, you know, fear, don't do it. What, what keeps people in sustained evolution or sustained recovery or sustained appreciation of life is when they connect to something that feeds them and nourishes them the carrot you know they take something in that is about a million times better than anything that they were ever doing so you ask the question of, of whether my connection now is more profound than in any drug-induced experience and I'm going to tell you yes it is and if it wasn't I wouldn't be doing it and it is so amazing so one night we were out here and um, we had one of my shaman friends from Peru and it was the solstice and we were out at night and the fire's going and we're doing our vision quests and all this stuff and it occurred to me in that moment, you know, if people from um, my old life or, you know, I call it the regular world, whatever that is, could see us now, they would think that we were crazy. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that actually that reality is way more connective, expansive, and permanent. It's eternal than this transient reality that we have created. So what's interesting is, I'm looking at some of the things that are happening on the news. Mm. We say, God, is that, that's reality, right? That's real. Is that the reality we want? You know, it's about suffering and war and all the things that we, we don't want to connect to. But if we keep connecting them, we'll keep creating them. So connect to the soul, and that's that's where it's all happening. Can you tell us two words about the, the what's behind you? Yeah, this is our um, nine-ring labyrinth, and labyrinths are usually either seven rings or eleven rings. This one wanted to be nine, and this was cut into a mountaintop here, and I saw this here five years ago be, before it ever came into its physical existence. It kept calling and saying, would you please scrape the dirt off the top so I can see the sun? And so we did, and uh, a, local, a local mathematician designed it for us, and um, he also designed all the mandalas in the rooms. Mm. And he's a great journeyer, and that's why he was connected to us. And we brought all this material up here in a little pickup truck. There's almost 200 tons of dirt here that we brought by hand in a little uh, pickup truck and it just wanted to happen and it unfolded and the labyrinth is a meditative tool and there's a lot of technology behind it and it balances the right and left hemispheres and it represents the great journey within and there's so many symbolic and literal uses for a labyrinth and it's just it's an amazing place to just be and be quiet and meditate and let go and let go. The and cool be. Th <laughs> the cool thing about a labyrinth, there's only one way in and one way out. Mm. So we just walk it and we trust. We trust. It's not like a maze where, oh my God, I may get stuck. Well, that's a metaphor for life. The labyrinth is we just go and we, we are moving towards our center. Moving always towards our center. And then we get to our center. We say, off. Oh. Mm. And then we now move back into the outside world. And tell us, why did you choose to have a tipi? Tiki, tipi. The TP is, uh, it's very interesting. The TP, if you watch any Western movie, you'll notice that TPs are, uh, the Native Americans put their TPs on flat land. That TP happens to be on the side of a mountain, and um, we had to build up the dirt by hand, maybe, you know, six or eight feet on the one side. So that TP actually took about a year to fully construct. And what was interesting, one of our uh, guests that was here that, lives in Sedona, it was really representative of his journey. 
he really wanted to do it and have it. Mm. And by the time he was finished, he was a different human. He was a different being. And so it's a place where we do ceremony and so forth. Mm. And so here, you, this is the sanctuary. These are the buildings, your home and the meditation room back there? It is. So we have, we have five guest rooms here and we live here as well. Mm -hmm. So that all happens in that complex and the rooms are, they're just comfortable. We just put a good bed. That mm -hmm. was the most important thing that people need. I can need. confirm that. At the end of the day, you need a good bed and we live here. So it's very, the work is very intense. It's very intimate. It's very one-on-one -on -one, and it gives us really a chance to connect with people. So when people come here, they are, they are stepping into a community and community is something we are also really thirsty for. It's, we're so thirsty for community. So what's wild is that people like you come and then we have people that are staying here that might be here for whatever difficulties they may be having. Then we have our practitioners and then we have people from town and then we all converge in this place and nobody knows who who's the guest, who's the practitioner, who's the visitor, who's this, because everybody's sharing these amazing ideas and you never know when the big spark, the big shift is going to happen. We're taught, you know, Lilu, in I'm looking for a big piece, I've got a big problem, I want a big solution. Every little piece is important. So you never know where any little piece is going to come and so that's the whole point of people coming here because every part of the experience is designed to work on a different aspect of your being. So there's things we work, we help people to work on their beliefs and their shadow pieces and their stories that they tell themselves about who they are and all the things they can't do and work on their bodies. Um, our psychologists and psychiatrists work on their minds and you know we're working on their soul and the shamanic path and, and we do a lot of ritual and ceremony and things that help people to remember that they're sacred and they're, re and they're real and whole. Yeah, and yeah. that's something nobody can take away once it's there and reconnected to. Once that happens, nobody can take that away. And I'll just let people know if you're jumping on any kind of spiritual path, if you're jumping on a path of self-discovery, prepare yourself because once you get on, you are not getting off again. There's no turning back. Because once we know something, Lilu, we cannot unknow it. Once we know that there's more for us, that our heart knows that it can connect to something, then we can't just say, oh no, I'm just going to stay over here and be all shut down and, and your soul will really give you some good lessons then. So once we step on this path, and you probably can confirm that, you can't, you can't go back. And you wouldn't want to. And you wouldn't want to, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you, Lilu. Hello, Angel! Hello, <laughs> it was so nice meeting you guys! <laughs> Much love! Bye!